So this talk, I was asked to talk a little bit about what, what, is, what we're doing in terms of eliminating PERS virus. And I have really kind of two sections to the talk. The first is I'm going to show you some data that we've been collecting since July on the incidence of PERS, that being what's the rate of infection that is taking place in the industry. And, and I'll show you some data with regards to that. That's the kind of the first data that we've had and that we're able to say, well, PERS is you know, covering this percentage of farms or that percentage of farms, et cetera. So I'll show you that. And then uh, the second part of the project or part of the paper is to talk to you a little bit about breeding herds and what we know about eliminating or controlling the virus within breeding herds. And we've had a, a study that I want to show you some of the data on where we've been following, I think it's upwards of 50 farms, sow farms, and following the PERS within those sow farms over time. And I'm going to show you some of the reports that are coming out of that uh, study. And basically, to summarize what we're going to learn in the next half hour or so, is that um, what we've seen over the last, since July 1 of last year, when we started tracking PERS incidents, roughly of the, of the group of herds we've been following, which is about 200 sow farms, about half of them have had a new infection that we're aware of um, uh, with PERS. And that underestimates the, uh, the overall incidence within that group of herds, and I'll show you why. But the basic message of that is that PERS infection is extremely common through the fall, through the, through the winter, and then dies out in the spring. I'll show you that. And then there's another little mini break that's actually just finishing up right now, and then it'll trickle on through the summer and start up again next fall. That's the first message. The second message is on the um, eliminating PERS from breeding herds, you, you, you may have heard of a program called herd closure, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. But traditionally, we've said, you know, if you close the farm for about 200 days, and we'll talk about that in more detail, then the virus will work its way out. It'll disappear. And what we've learned in this project is, no, that's not right. Um, it's not that simple. It, it only seems to eliminate itself from about half of the farms in about 200 days. And the rest of them take longer, and we'll talk about why. Okay? So that's what we're going to talk about in this particular presentation. So just uh, to start it off, you realize perhaps that a recent study funded by the Pork Board estimated the cost of PERS, and this was done by Dr. Holtkamp, and this number is very similar to a number that was found in 2005, I think, Lisa, by Eric Newman, roughly 580 million in that particular study, 664 million per year uh, is what the estimate of the clinical impact of PERS is in breeding pigs, breeding sows, growing pigs, etc. We're moving, we're getting, the data that I'm going to show you on incidents, you could take it as being we're making no progress, but that's not quite true. We're making an enormous amount of progress. And we're moving more towards eliminating the virus from not only farms, but also regions. And one of the ways by which we've done that, we know that DPOP works, that's well documented, but this most recent one, herd closure, um, was, it's actually only known for about 10 years we've realized that, wow, we can eliminate PERS virus from sow herds by this project by this process called herd closure. It really only applies to farrow to wean farms. Farrow to finish farms, it's gonna be more difficult where you've got that, the, the growing pigs on site which provide a nice source for reef virus to keep circulating within the farm. So the herd closure program that we're gonna be talking about really refers to farrow to wean farms. And it says here that um, you know, the, the whole idea of this, feral, this herd closure program is stop the gilts moving into the farm for at least six months. And the, the preliminary data that we have indicates that, and, I'll, and again, I'll show you this in detail, at least 85% of the farms, you can eliminate the virus from the breeding farm, you can 
wean negative pigs, virus, no virus in the negative pigs, and it's a highly successful program if you stick to the guidelines. Now, I'm going to show you this chart. As I told you, I'm going to show you some data on the incidence of PERS. And I'm going to just explain this for a moment. What you see down here is July 1 of uh, three, years, three years of data. So July 1, and then this red line is current. Uh, this red line down here is the proportion or the percentage of farms that became infected each week. Okay, so you've got 100, we've got 192 farms that we're following in this chart, and down here you can see this particular week, for example, maybe, I don't know, maybe 4% of the farms became infected, and then a week later, another 4%, one week later, maybe 1%, and so on and so forth. So every week down on, the, on this axis, axis is the number or the percentage of farms that became newly infected. Okay. When we sum this line up, then you get this line. So this would say that so far, if you add all these up, so far about 50% of our farms had a new infection that we're aware of since July 1 of 2011. Okay? And you say, well, is that, you know, how's that? As soon as we had those data, then the participants said, well, we have data from previous years. Let's look at that. Because how does it compare? And that's what these two lines are. The, blue, the green line is 2000, July 1, 2009 through June 30th, 2010. And you can see it was about 43% of those same farms became infected. And the blue line is July 1 of 2010 through June 30th of 2011, so the next year. And you see it's amazingly similar in my view at least. I look at that and I think, holy smokes, I didn't know it was so similar, at least in that group of herds, uh, you know, for those three years of time. And those three, those, that group of herds is not necessarily representative of the U.S. industry. It's a grab sample, convenient sample of 192 herds who were willing to share their diagnostic information with us. So it doesn't necessarily represent the heart of Iowa, southern Minnesota, Indiana, they're just herds spread out around the Midwest, and again, not necessarily representative of the U.S. But I still look at that and I say, wow, that's really interesting, because it's the first data that I'm aware of that says, okay, yeah, I mean, we all might have said PERS is worse in the fall, and the other piece that isn't here is the higher is the density, the higher is the likelihood you're going to get it, and you'd say, well, you know, so what? I knew that before, but I've never seen it so well documented as it is here. Okay, so this, this, you can say this year it was slightly worse in, in this group of farms than it was in the last two years. And when we look at, it says here these are five systems. So these are five uh, production systems where there's, maybe, maybe there's anywhere I think from, I think about 20 farms in one of the systems to 30 or 40 farms in another one of the systems. They're not necessarily all the same owner, it might be a coordinated group of owners but it's at least some degree of oversight so that I can collect the data relatively easily. And when we look across the five systems, they didn't all have a worse year this year. Some of them might have had a worse year in 2009. Some of them might have had a worse year in 2010. So it varies quite a bit. But overall, you can see it's very similar. Now I'm going to show you another chart with the same data, just presented differently. Okay, this particular chart, now just look at this line here with the red squares on it. Again, this is July 1, and down we, down, here we are down here at the end of the year, so June 30th. And the red, red dots down here are indicating the level of infection in the fall. Then you can see here in mid-November, it, it dramatically increased stayed high, and then went down in the spring. And then we had another little blip right here. Okay. So that is um, a technique that's used in the human influenza world to try and tell us when does the epidemic start in influenza. 
And so we just used that same technique for PERS and you can see, oh, well, at least in this data set of 192 farms, the epidemic or the, 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 start, the start of this big break was around mid-November. It died out here in March and we had another little break in the, in the spring. Okay? And the last two years, it was remarkably similar. Not, not, not exactly similar, but you can see it broke through this red line in the fall, stayed high, generally high, and then had another break here in the spring. Okay. Before we proceed, any questions on that? Because that's the first sort of take home that I wanted to show you. Those are new data. We've never had those before. It's a bunch of herds and systems that are participating and sharing their data with you on a voluntary basis. Any questions on that? I don't know that it's representative of the U.S. My gut is it is. I bet it's a higher incidence, the higher is your density. So in the heart of Iowa, it's no doubt higher than that. In, in the mid, you know, out in the Nebraska, let's say, where it's lower density, it's gonna be lower than that. But the general picture will be the same. Okay, so one of the things, one of the perhaps um, statements of progress is that regardless of your incidence of infection, everybody wants to produce negative wean pigs. Okay, that's the goal. You're, 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 even in a high density area, you're gonna to say to yourself, well, I really, I know I'm gonna get infected. I can't keep it out. I'm in a high density area. My farm isn't filtered, let's say. I know I'm gonna get infected, but I still want to try and produce PERS negative pigs as quickly as I can because I know they perform better than if they're PERS positive. So we would say that the objective in some cases in control is to live with the virus but wean PERS negative pigs and you're going to do that through trying to get PERS negative semen, this, this process that's called McRebel that being no fostering and minimizing transfer within the farrowing house and a whole set of steps beyond that. A GILT program and which may include the use of resident virus, and we can talk a little bit more about that, may include vaccine, or in some cases, uh, people don't use any virus vaccine. And may include vaccination of the sow farm also. So all of these things are part of the process that even if a farm is gonna get infected, most farms, most veterinarians will recommend, well, let's pursue getting negative pigs at least as quickly as we can. So I want to just lead you through this, these, this classification guideline here because it's becoming um, fairly common terminology within the industry when we're talking about a, a sow herd's PERS status. So clearly you would recognize a herd as being infected, a herd as being not infected, or a, or a herd being unknown. So there's three statuses. Now, Within those, within those that positive infected, we talk about a herd being positive stable or positive unstable. And basically what we mean by that is, are the weaned pigs PERS negative? Or can you find PERS in the weaned pigs or not? If you can't find pigs, if you can't find PERS virus in the weaned pigs, we would call that farm PERS stable. Okay, which is, which is a goal. You want to produce PERS non-infected pigs, okay, or non-detectable pigs. That's your goal. Because you can, you, can, you can move those pigs, let's say, even if you're moving them into a high density area, you can get them vaccinated and the data would suggest you can perform, those pigs will perform better than if they come out of the farm and they're PERS positive. Okay, so you have PERS, that is a newly infected farm, we would call that PERS, that farm PERS infected and unstable. PERS is all over the place, and that's gonna be here. It's PERS is in the sow farm, it's going out in the breeding pig, it's going out in the wean pigs, it's PERS infected and it's PERS unstable. Now your goal is to get that, that farm as quickly as possible in this direction now, to be PERS stable, meaning, you may still have some PERS in the GDU, let's say. 
purposefully. You may be using either live virus or vaccine in your GDU to try and promote immunity in the GDU in order to have a high degree of immunity when those gilts come into the breeding farm. But your goal is to have negative weaned pigs. So that would be a PERS positive stable farm. There's still virus around, but not in the weaned pigs. And there's a testing sort of strategy beyond that. What we typically will do is we'll say, well, how do you know when a farm is PERS stable? Well, a minimum guideline would be, well, let's breed, let's bleed 30 pigs a month for four months. Okay, so over a 90 day period, actually, the beginning of, let's say, time zero, day 30, day 60, day 90, would be four bleeds, 30 pigs a bleed, you can't find it anywhere, you're, you're going to be somewhat confident that it's not there. Not 100% confident, but you're pretty confident that it's not there. We would call that farm per stable. Now, to go one step further, um, you may say at this level, well, okay, I am in a relatively medium, low density area. I'm going to take my chances on not having any vaccine, live virus vaccine, or not any resident virus going on in my GDU. I'm going to, I'm going to try and become a negative sow farm. In which case, you'd eliminate the use of virus, whether it's resident virus or, or vaccine in the gilts and in the sows, and you would then become what is called PERS stable, and we just, it's a, just a slight category, type A, 2A, type 2B, but it's still stable with no virus now going on. Now you've got negative gilts, right? They haven't seen any live virus, they haven't seen any vaccine, they're, they're ELISA negative. You're starting to move ELISA negative gilts into your breeding herd. They're a great sentinel animal. Right? If, you, if you are moving negative gilts into the breeding herd and they remain negative, you're increasingly confident that the virus is completely gone from that cell farm. So you can see here that we would call this farm so-called provisionally negative. When you've got at least 60 gilts that have moved into the farm and have remained negative for at least 60 days, we're going to call it provisionally negative. Pretty confident that there's no virus there. And lastly, the whole herd is ELISA negative. Now those are going to be probably multipliers, nucleus herds, herds that are out in a low density area. There isn't an antibody in the, in the farm. Everybody is antibody negative. Hasn't seen the virus in years. Okay, that's going to be your highest level of so-called negative, ELISA negative. Okay, so in the heart of Iowa, we're going to be in this zone here, in the red zone, in the orange zone. We're going to be getting infected because of the nature of your, of your neighborhood, and you're going to try and pursue PERS negative pigs as quickly as possible. How are you going to do that? And you're going to do that probably through this so-called herd closure program. So this herd closure program, as I said, was first described just 10 years ago, and it was a great finding. It was a realization that a PERS negative population can be established from positive sources by managing the gilt pool and pig flow. That was a breakthrough. That was a hallelujah moment when we said, wow, we can eliminate PERS virus from breeding herds and we don't have to depop them. That's a great breakthrough. So the herd closure, in essence, is you are going to, you, the herd closure is you're going you're gonna to stop putting kindling on the fire, right? You're going to not introduce gilts for a while. And, and to do that, you don't want to suffer, let's say, a lack of gilts. So before you do that, you're going to bring in as many gilts as possible. And you might even do an off-site breeding project. And so you're in that, and that's what we call the loading phase. You're going to bring in as many gilts as possible, probably age staggered, because you're going to need them for you know as, when you run out of your gilts, when you run because you're closing the farm. You're going to need these gilts. So then you close the farm, and you can anticipate closing it for at least seven months. And this is where we have learned in this study. We used to say 200 days. 
It'll be, it'll work great. And what I'm going to show you is no, 200 days works in about half the farms. Half the farms aren't there yet. And then, so that's the load, that's the close, and then we have this expose. The idea there is, well, if the farm becomes infected today, new infection comes in, you're going to help it out. And you're going to, you don't have to do this, by the way. This is just something that, it's become industry standard, um, and, but we don't really have any data comparing helping it out versus not helping it out. We don't, you know, so we, the general guideline has been, well, let's help it out, but we don't have proof that that's better than not helping it out. Intuitively, I think it is, but I can't prove it. And you help it out either with the virus that just infected the farm or with live virus vaccine. And so you, the, 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 with the program with resident virus, basically you, you get virus out of suckling pigs, out of their serum, you dilute it and you work with your veterinarian and then you expose the whole farm. And basically you're spreading the virus around so that everybody gets infected and you get your hits out, get them over with, get it over with, is the idea. Okay, and I'm gonna to talk to you and I'm gonna show you a little bit about a data about, well what about the hit that you take on performance? Because you're going to take a hit on performance and I'll show you how long that takes place. Negative semen in McRebel, monitor progress in the wean pigs. That's what we're doing with this herd closure program. Now, <clears throat> Nathan Schaefer, a veterinarian with Iowa Select, did a study with me in 2007, five years after this program. We went into 15 farms and we said, well, let's do this herd closure program and let's compare the number of wean pigs coming out a year after the herd closure program to a herd to the year before. Did we, you know, in other words, we did this herd closure program, did it, did it make us any money in terms of pigs out the door? And what this is, is the uh, net change in the number of pigs weaned by farm. And so you can see at the 15 farms, all but two, these two, all but two had more pigs weaned the year after herd closure than the year before inferring that the herd closure program perhaps improved performance. You got a bump in, in productivity, maybe caused by PERS, maybe caused by other things before you did the herd closure, but certainly we can say herd closure didn't hurt them in terms of pigs weaned out the door. Now, just a comment, we're not gonna go into sampling, but just a quick comment on sampling. I said, that what you're going to do at this farm over time is monitor in the wean pigs. So we might go in and do 15 a week, or 30 a month, or 10 a week, but what you're trying to do as you monitor these wean pigs, and then you generally will pool the serum and submit it for PCR for virus, what you're trying to do is find a, 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 you know, the low prevalence situation. It's not mine. I don't think. It's, uh, you're finding a low prevalence situation. Right after the break, it's, it's, it's easy to find PERS in wean pigs. It's everywhere. You can take five pigs, take three pigs, and you'll find virus. But one month, two months, three months, four months, five months, six months after that break, it becomes increasingly difficult to find because it's increasingly less, less and less frequent. So the more you test, you're never 100% confident unless you bleed every, bleed every pig in the farrowing house, which you can't afford to do. So you're, if you bleed 60 samples at one point in time, you can say, I'm really confident, we would say 95% confident, that less than 5% of that population of pigs out there has virus. You're not 100% confident that none of them have it. You can only say, I'm really confident that the prevalence is really low. And so that's what, ha that's what takes when, we're, when we have to put those sentinel gilts in and we follow those and we continue testing over time. All you're trying to do is get increasingly confident that the farm doesn't have PERS in the wean pigs. Now, just look at a, what happens with a farm over time. So the herd becomes infected here. It's called positive unstable. It's really easy to find virus at weaning. It's all over the place. 
right? What happens then is, you, you, let's say you, you, it becomes increasingly difficult to find because the prevalence goes down, and if you do a herd closure program, you may not be able to find it if you're successful over 90 days. Let's say you find 0, 30, 60, 90, you can't find it. We would then call that farm per stable. It may have virus going into it in terms of got virus in the breeding, in the GDU, you might be using resident virus, you might be using vaccine, you might be vaccinating the sow farm. It's just, and you might choose just, it's, I'm in central Iowa, that's the way I'm gonna keep going. And that's a completely valid strategy. It's a great strategy if you know or you're fairly confident you're gonna get infected again next year. Don't pursue per stable without any coverage in your gills if you know you're gonna get infected again. Don't go provisionally negative if your chances of infection are high. Okay, just stay right here. Now, if on the other hand, your chances of, of infection are low, you might go further on down this continuum and you might say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to stop immunizing my gilts, whether it's with resident virus or vaccine, and I'm going to eliminate virus from the breeding herd, no further live virus exposure where then we would characterize this herd as being positive stable and slightly different to B rather than to A. Okay? We continue and we move negative gilts in and they remain negative, it's called provisionally negative, and then finally the whole herd is negative, it's now ELISA negative. That's the continuum as we, as we were reviewing earlier. Now, let's look at our study where we looked at this um, herd closure program. And there's been no study like this done before. We have um, data that I can show you so far on 35 farms. The, um, this is the um, 25 of these farms used live virus when they did the exposure. So the farm became infected, they got virus out of the serum, and they used that resident live virus to expose the sow farm. Fifth, 10 of the farms used vaccine. Why? Because they were worried that they'd make it worse, they'd have a worse clinical break with the live virus than with the vaccine. Okay? And we're comparing that, that, that's a main objective in this study to compare those two treatments, but we don't have those data for you yet. Okay, some other data just comparing these two categories just to show that they were very similar. These farms were approximately 3,500 sows. These farms were about 2,400 sows. Um, everything else was basically quite similar. All right, so herds are being monitored by PCR in the serum. We do monthly testing starting at 12 weeks after the exposure and herds are considered we call them negative in quotes, it's not negative, it's just you didn't detect virus, after four consecutive negative tests on the wean pigs. Okay, so we're, what we're doing is we're trying to characterize how long did it take from exposure until you didn't find virus with four, four consecutive tests. How long does it take? Now, I'm just gonna show this for a minute because there's a, an enormous amount of data on this chart. Each row is a sow farm. Okay, so you got, I think, 35 sow farms here. The first bunch, whoops, hang on a minute. The first bunch had live virus. Okay, this bunch down here had vaccine as the exposure. When you see a red box, that means they were positive pigs at weaning. Each column is a week. So starting at 12 weeks, they if we take LVI 15, so far, sow farm 15, they were positive, 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 all the way here until week 25. We had our first batch of 30 pigs that tested negative. We then had, uh, where was I, 15. Another week, another week, another week. So there's five weeks of negative pigs. I said we, five tests, we needed um, four times 30, so we need, whatever that is, 12 weeks, right? So they didn't make the, 
the long enough time and then this means the herd got reinfected with either a new isolet and they pulled out or they pulled out. But they said, we're done, we're not participating anymore. Now, on the other hand, this farm here, LVI 21, you see a little asterisk there, it achieved negative here in the uh, 29th week. So where you see an asterisk was the point at which they found no further virus. Okay, so reds found virus, green no virus. Here's one that at 12 weeks in, there was no more virus. That's unusual. And you get a feel for the first thing as you look at these, you say, wow, there's a lot of variability across these farms. Some are really short and some are really long, like this one. How depressing is that? Week 38, still finding virus. Okay, and the, the farm's going crazy because it's still closed. They got no gilts, they're out of gilts, and they're saying, you know, maybe next week we won't have any virus. And you can imagine the amount of testing that's going on in terms of what are we doing? Are we dragging it around? Are we cross-fostering pigs? Are we not doing the all in all out? What are we doing wrong that our virus at our farm continues to test positive and everybody else, you know, looking at this, is done? They're, what are we doing wrong? So an enormous amount of variability. This is the same data just presented differently showing, well, how many farms were negative at 12 weeks? Well, one or two. And, and, and as, you, as the weeks along the x-axis go up, it's the proportion of farms where we've no longer detected virus. So here at 200 days post-closure, about 50% of our farms can no longer detect virus. Okay, remember I said at the beginning, we thought, we thought 200 days when we went into this, 200 days you're done. But 200 days only half the farms are done. And you can see that the rest of them are coming here, but it's, it's slow. And, and we don't know today whether it's slow because they're doing something wrong. You know, we don't know why are these farms slow and these farms fast. We don't know. Um, but that's, that's another part of the study. We're going to try and look at risk factors for time to being negative. Question? Any correlation possible between what the uh, We looked at some of the, the, the question was um, maybe the strain. One would intuitively think a weak strain, like a clinically weak strain, maybe slow, maybe spreads less well. Maybe a more virulent sprain, strain while it's clinically devastating, maybe it spreads throughout, you get great herd immunity and it dies out quicker. Or I could make the other argument for the weak strain. In either case, no. We've looked at virulent strain 144, because a lot of these farms had 144. Was there any difference between whether they had 144 or not? No. The one variable that has showed up so far is uh, herd size. Uh, the larger was the herd, the longer time it takes. And as I said, we're looking at, we don't have the data finished yet on live virus versus vaccine virus used for the exposure program. Another question, yes. So then along with the larger herd size, would there be differences between the larger herds and the smaller herds in terms of pig flow, you know, how many different rooms there were, or? Very well could be, and we don't know that yet. Could be. You know, you tend to think the more compartmentalized a farm is, the less likely it or the harder it is to spread. You know, that's the nature of all in all out. Let's let's try and compartmentalize it. But here we're trying to get it all over and done with. Okay, so just a couple of Jim Lowe, <clears throat> a veterinarian in um, Illinois, has been working on works with the Mashoff systems and they've done uh, some of the trying to standardize their protocol for herd closure programs. And all of these slides by the way are going to be available. Um, and so he's trying to put a standard operating procedure. When a herd breaks, here's what we do. A, B, C, it's just like a recipe. And so he, I'm going to show you a protocol that they're putting into place for how to manage the sows, the pigs, the pig flow, etc. when they're doing a herd closure program. 
But he would say, all right, what are our concerns? Why might that cell farm still at 38 weeks be um, positive virus? Well, maybe, maybe it has to do with vaccination in the cells. Maybe we're, we're dragging it around when we go to vaccinate, let's say, preferral. We know it, 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 it's in the blood of animals, and maybe it's in our vaccination protocol, maybe. Maybe we're screwing up on the gilts. Maybe the feedback material. You know, maybe the water troughs, maybe group housing. Those are some issues that could be involved that would perpetuate spread. We, we know that cross-fostering in nurse sows will perpetuate it in farrowing. And similarly, in pig-to-pig, -pig, cross-fostering, processing equipment, warming boxes, you can find it everywhere in farrowing. Uh, you know, if your procedures are dirty, you'll just track it around and you'll just keep it going. Then this chart, which we won't go through, I'll show you one of the lines. This is available um, through your veterinarian. This is a, 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 a um, committee that Jim's on through the AASV. And we'll just look at one of the lines. So for example, within sow management, here we've got the sow herd statuses along the top. So positive, unstable, meaning newly infected. Okay. And then at the opposite extreme, ELISA negative. It's the multiplier out in western North Dakota. So how do you manage your gilts? Well, within this positive, unstable, we're going to have no gilts because the herd's closed. And then early in the positive, stable, you know, might still have no gilts. Then gilts are allowed in. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea on this little table. As you move across these different sow statuses, what's allowed and what's not allowed with regards to the standard operating procedure that Dr. Lowe is developing. We look at down here, wash all crates with dry time between litters. And you can see, yes, they try to do dry time between litters all the way out until when the herd is ELISA negative and you can be a little bit more forgiving. Why? Because there's no virus there. So you got a little bit more room for error when there's no virus there. And similarly down here, movements at less than 24 hours of age. No, no, but then when you're positive stable, we know that we'd like to do a little fostering. Right? You don't want to even up some litters. You want to, you know, it's a nice management strategy. But it's a great way to spread PERS when PERS is around. So when you're trying to stop PERS, you don't do it. After, as soon as you're confident, somewhat confident that PERS is gone, you got a little bit of room for error. Okay, this is not for you, this is for me. Uh, I don't intend you to look at this, but just some, some data. I told you I'd give you some data on the, how much that outbreak cost across those 35 farms in terms of production. So we're just starting to collect those data now, get all the data back from the farms, and what was the production impact? Um, what it took here, this is telling me time to baseline production. How long did it take from break to get back to baseline? 20, no, 18 weeks. So roughly 18 weeks across these 35 farms, they were able to get back to where they were before the break started in terms of pigs out the door. Another piece, though, however, is that little standard deviation of 13 weeks. What that means to me is it was really variable. Some farms were quicker, some farms were longer. So 18 weeks on average, but that's not necessarily how, what your farm is going to achieve when you, get, when you have a break. Next thing was, well, how bad were these breaks, these 35 farms? And that's what this number is, the reduction of pigs per thousand sows from load close homogenize or load close expose from when we started until when we got to baseline. How many pigs did we lose? These 35 farms lost or didn't wean about 2,200 pigs per thousand sows. That's what the impact was across those 35 sow farms on average. And this standard deviation says, and it was really variable really variable. Some of them were relatively mild. Some of them, looking at that number, lost about 5,000 pigs per thousand sows. So Jim's cleanup, Jim's summary. We, we've learned a lot in herd closure. 
Now we're saying, all right, close the herd for, it's going to be at least 30 weeks. Count on at least 30 weeks. Load the farm as much as possible, up to 20 weeks. Offsite breeding project might make a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, sense, depending on your circumstances. And then the standard management practices is the, that table that I was talking to you about that will be available either on this slides or through your veterinarian. And then he's given some estimates on costs, increased testing, and estimate of, remember, what we're doing is we're, all we're trying to do is pursue negative pigs at weaning as quickly as possible because those will make you money. Purs negative pigs will make you money regardless of how, how you manage your sow farm going ahead. Remember, you're in a high dense area, you may choose to live with the virus, but you're still gonna pursue negative pigs at weaning. And there's the payback on doing that. 10 to 12 weeks to capture those costs back in terms of improved performance of the wean pigs. So in closing, half the herds, half the herds require at least 200 days. Now, we may be able to improve that by learning more about why are some of them slow, but today we don't know. So you want to count on at least seven months if you're doing a herd closure program. Maybe you're lucky, maybe you're not. Follow the protocols, and as we said, we, we need to get a better understanding of why some farms are slow. We don't know that today. Where we are, where we are headed is, as I said earlier, we've, we've got this voluntary producer-driven regional control program. In a low density area, low to medium density, farms are pursuing elimination. They're, they're saying, we think the risk of infection here is low enough, we're not going to continually feed the guilt pool with whether it's vaccine virus or resident virus. We're going to tr pursue elimination. But in the higher density areas, you're still going to pursue wean negative pigs, but you're either going to filter or you're going to live with virus and you're going to say, I'm going to have an L a live virus or live virus vaccine program in the gilts and maybe in the sow farm. Okay. And the other thing that's really exciting is there's a, a, a it's just a, a really exciting change, I think, in attitude and a willingness to, to share data across farms and across systems. People are saying, you know, whatever I've been doing, I need your help. Here's my data. Here's my, here's my experiences. Here's my per sequence. You know, I'll share it with you. And, and there's just an increasing sharing of data taking place uh, compared to historically.